maps and graphs, because my job is to think uh, big scale. <coughs> but I will end with some baby bird pictures, so stay with me. <laughs> so what I was going to do is talk about uh, some of the large scale grassland bird uh, population monitoring that uh, is being done and how we're using that to, to guide conservation, to support the uh, uh, medium scale conservation and then uh, how that can influence uh, local scale management decisions. So the Oaks and Prairie Joint Venture Coordinator and, and what a joint venture is, is uh, we implement the national bird conservation plans, taking them from the national level down to the, the uh, turning dirt on the ground basically and try to link all of those different scales of decisions being made. So, Every day I'm thinking about the, the Oaks and Prairies, which is 45 million acres plus another uh, Edwards Plateau, 14 million acres. So that's like the state of Oklahoma plus the state of West Virginia. And a lot of what, I've, what we've built on, at the very large scale is based on the Breeding Bird Survey, which is a uh, citizen science based uh, monitoring system for birds across the United States. Started in 1966. Uh, 3,700 routes are run, uh, 2,900 of them are conducted annually. Uh, their volunteers go out between late May and June and run a 25 mile uh, transect and collect 50 points in between sunrise and 10 a.m. And because we have data going back to 1966, we can uh, follow the trends of birds and use that to look at what's going on with ecosystems. And especially for us in the Oaks and Prairies, we use the birds to track what happens with the grasslands. So these are a few of the grassland birds that we have, a few of the common grassland birds in the Oaks and Prairies. And this is their trend annually. And just looking at those, they kind of look like big numbers, but you know, if you were, if this was your retirement account, you wouldn't be happy with these returns of minus seven or minus three percent. But since 1966, if you calculate them out, that's how much it has been lost in those various populations based on those uh, annual rates of between uh, three and, and seven percent. So for each of those species, the, a lot have been lost, but these are some of our most common birds still. And so we can go through and use that data and figure out where birds are being lost and, and there's, uh, where the birds are. So there's a distribution map for the northern bobwhite and, as an example, and where the, they tend to be uh, declining or increasing. The red indicates the decline. The blue indicates the places where they're increasing. And we could also take the data and figure out, okay, that's the trend. Put a line to it. How long do we have before that is going to hit zero, and it's pretty soon. But what's really going to happen is they're going to level off somewhere, and that's what all the populations do. But they, are they going to level off at a, at a <coughs> level that's acceptable to us? And what can we do to reverse that? And so that's what the whole job is: trying to get a whole bunch of different uh, NGO partners and, and federal partners and state partners working together to help landowners do conservation on the ground. So here's some more ugly numbers of, of the losses between 1970 and 2000 for some of our uh, focal species within the, the oaks and prairies. But all of those species, this, is the, this represents the most common species that are detected by the Breeding Bird Survey. The ones I highlighted in yellow are our grassland birds. So our most common bird that we're detecting is, is eastern meadowlark, and it's one of the ones that is seriously uh, has some, showing some serious decline. So it's not just about endangered species, it's about common birds and keeping them as common where they're, they should be common by taking care of the, the habitat. So what we've done uh, over the past eight years since the, the joint venture partnership started is put together some plans, pulled together partners to say, okay, what can we do and where could we do some work? and do a lot of work with spreadsheets and calculating population numbers. And what I really wanted to show you is just how big some of these numbers get. Uh, this is to, to bring back populations 10 years from today. It, it's gonna take 3 million acres out of that 60 million acres of habitat work. 
to turn it around from marginal habitat to good habitat, whatever that means, for these grasslands and shrubland species. And so we're working towards uh, um, achieving that objective, and we've got a, a, a grassland restoration incentive program that we started with a grant from ConocoPhillips and a grant from the Upland Game Bird Stand Fund, and now we just got a grant from uh, the Monarch Conservation Fund to do prairie work on the ground. The first two years, we've been able to do 40,000 acres. 40,000 acres, and we need three million in 10 years. There's other programs doing other things, and we're starting to try to count all those up, but uh, just adding a, a new program that's fairly simple, we know that uh, we need to ramp up those efforts if we want to hit that goal, and that's the spreadsheets I was talking about. That's, that's all these numbers are telling us right now. So we have areas where we're working, uh, 19 counties, where we're trying to focus our efforts of, of putting conservation on the ground, uh, you know, monitoring birds, and um, you know, getting research done, and uh, organizing the people who work with landowners to talk to each other and, and, and to start working together. And the part I'm gonna talk about a little bit now is just the monitoring part, because if you don't monitor, how do you know if you're making an impact? And so we uh, started counting birds in some of these areas. We hire undergraduates because they're cheap and, and, <laughs> and it's, we can abuse them for a month and a half and they're, they, they stay relatively happy the whole time. We train them on 14 different bird species and then they can go out and cover 2,000 miles with their cars at 55 cents a mile, which they're pretty happy with, especially with the lower gas prices, and go throughout all those counties and count birds for us, and what we're able to do just in, in the, the Texas portion, we do five, five counts per county, uh, it's about 30 points in the morning, and then they're done for the day at 10 a.m., and uh, we do that between May 15th and June 30th, so they only work for a, a month and a half on that, and then they're pretty much spent. And this is kind of what it looks like. We were just out doing some of these counts uh, in, in this area the last two days, fall tubby counts, but this is all spring stuff that we're doing with the, the field assistants. And so what we've been able to do is, here's a bunch of graphs showing different things, but the, what to look at is uh, 2013, 2014 were the dry years, 2015 was really, really wet. So wet that it made it difficult to get on some of these roads to do these counts. And you can see what happened to the bobwhite quail and the, in the green bars way up there for some of these counties, but others still very, very difficult to find. Ellis County is, is almost eaten by the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and that's why we're, probably why we're not finding northern bobwhite there. <laughs> right here, Dallas-Fort Worth is right there. Dick Sissels, these are birds that uh, are neotropical migrants. They winter down in the Llanos in Venezuela, and then they come back up in, to the United States to breed and their population numbers uh, shot up here in Texas because they come to Texas, if it's dry, to check it out, say, no food here, they keep moving north, and they go breed uh, farther north in the Great Plains. But when it was wet this year, they hung out and they stayed through the whole summer nesting here. So we're kind of closer to where they're gonna migrate to, so it shortens their migration distance if they can nest down here in Texas, but if it's too wet, or if it's too dry, it looks like they keep moving on, and that's a pretty cool you know, pattern. So we got to be thinking about not just our prairies here in Texas for birds, but we got to be thinking about okay, where do they go, and and how do they, uh, uh, what other grasslands are they worried about? The grasslands down here in, in uh, Brazil and in Argentina are suffering some of the same uh, issues that we have up here of land use. Uh, changes in, in the way that uh, land is being used. So it, it's, uh, it's affecting the populations of not only their mig the migratory birds that go down there, but also their resident grassland birds, just like our resident grassland birds. And so one of the things that we can look at is how are we connected to other areas for uh, birds? This is just showing in Texas where birds uh, winter and in Texas where our 
birds that winter in Texas, where do they come from? And most of these are grassland birds. So we're connected up to Canada and have a lot of wintering sparrows that come to Texas. And we're connected to Central America and have a lot of uh, birds that breed in Texas, like painted bunting, uh, go down to Central America. And that's all based on uh, breeding bird survey data. But there's new data coming out, the eBird. Has anyone used eBird before? Yeah, it's not just great for you to keep track of your birds, it's also great for people like me who are looking at where birds are going and, and how we can conserve these birds. So uh, this is a model that they, they put out based on eBird data showing the time scale going across the bottom and the birds coming <coughs> into the United States and then leaving. There's to December. So this is the dick thistle that goes down to uh, north the Llanos in Venezuela and comes back up. You can see the there's the Mississippi Alluvial Valley right there where this used to be all forest. The Edwards Plateau shows up as an area that they seem to avoid based on eBird data. So all that stuff you're putting in, it's being used at, at large scale conservation. And the more we put in, the better the models are getting. Yeah, I, I, te I teach a class on bird migration yeah. This is a multi-year composite though, right? Not yes, it is. Yeah. And this is actually an older one. They've got, they've had more data. This is probably two or three years old. So here's Upland Sandpiper, which is the one that goes all the way down to the southern part of uh, South America. And if we watch it again, it'll come up and fill the oaks and prairies, but they don't breed here. They go up north and these, these are their breeding areas. And then they come back and hang out here for a while and then go to South America. Would that be late summer when they? Yep. Okay. So another thing that's coming out of this eBird data is we're looking at uh, private lands and species that are tied directly to private lands because it's, you know, public lands, federal lands, presumably we can manage those and, uh, you know, the government agencies of those lands should be able to provide good habitat. But on private lands, it's a little more difficult in some ways and a little easier in other ways that you can get a lot of uh, bang for your buck if you're working with private landowners who are also interested in wildlife. And so there's certain species like the scissor tail flycatcher where 2% of their population occurs on public land and 97% occurs on private lands. So that changes the strategies that we use for certain species and getting this all from eBird data from people putting in there, citizen scientists. Eastern Meadowlark is another one very much tied to private land, both in the, in the uh, there's the breeding season and the winter season. And so this is one summary from a State of the Birds report showing 97% uh, of their distribution on private lands Eastern meadowlark depends on grassland habitat provided by pastures and farm fields. There's six other obligate breeding species that also have distributions greater than 90% on private lands. So uh, starting to get more attention that these birds, we're not going to be able to do it with just refuges and, and setting aside land. We're going to need to work, work, work them into the working lands on the ground. And Another species that we have to kind of keep track of, not just the bird species, but this is uh, uh, housing density starting in the 1940s in Texas with models showing where the people are going to go. That's 2020, 2030. And so right now, for what we work with, the Oaks and Prairies, we have almost all the people except Houston to, to worry about in Texas and, and up into Oklahoma. And how do you work with that kind of area? And where can we get stuff done? And where can we be helpful? So the last thing I want to get down to is, is what can you do at the local scale? Besides putting in the eBird, which is a great thing, uh, thinking about timing of management for birds. Uh, we talked about this. The, the bee talk talked about this a little bit. Uh, we can make choices on when we're going out and mowing. This is a killdeer nest in the, in the field where they're mowing and uh, 
luckily this was in a park and a lot of the, the uh, park employees see the mom get off the nest and, and they actually went around the nest most of the time. I monitored six or seven of them this summer. But uh, you can choose what kind of, what time to mow and it, it's based on the types of grasses you put up. One argument for native grasses is there's cool season grasses which are usually the non-native stuff and then there's the native warm season grasses and the cool season grasses are, are planted because they have two peak growing seasons early in the spring when the, the soil's cooler and then uh, later in the fall when the soil cools off they'll have a uh, uh, second growing season whereas the warm season grasses like the temp soil temperature over 80 degrees and so you have mowing times that, that are optimal for cool season grasses versus warm season grasses but the nesting season for birds occurs right at this uh, first cutting and then if they're trying to do a third uh, a cutting in the middle here they'll they'll hit them at the beginning of the nesting season the birds will re-nest and then they'll hit them again at the, the end of the nesting season and uh, you'll have a great field of grasses lots of birds nesting in it but they're not producing any young because either they the nest is taken out or the young can't get away from the mowing machines and we have to do it you know we have to uh, do the mowing to produce the food but we can be smarter about it and you know maybe 20 percent of your area is warm season grasses and you're doing a cutting uh, later in the season which would affect the bird populations less so one more argument for native warm season grasses and so this is what a native warm gra season grass field would look like do you see the nest in there Here's a few more that I've been working with uh, uh, in, in Round Rock in a 250-acre urban savanna where they mow all the grass, but they have trees lining the road, stripes all over the place. <coughs> so that's all I have today. showed that a lot of the summer birds in this area uh, tend to have uh, summer ranges in Mexico, Central America, uh, the Northwestern Rim or South America. Right. But then there was a, a sort of a disjunct region of what looked to me to be pretty much covering the Pantanal. Right. So some um, of the grass, from, that's probably Dick Sickleson and Upland Sandpiper showing up there. Okay, I was going to ask you which yeah. birds they might have. Yeah, so that's just number of species, number of bird species that, that breed in Texas that go that right. winter in those areas. So if you have a piece of that, there may be some, uh, yeah, at least Upland Sandpiper, I can't, can't think of, maybe Dick Sickle might be in that, but that, that was that one disjunct. I know a guy was just down there, I'll call him. <laughs> yeah. Detecting any fire ant uh, impacts in, in the day? It, not in the data, we're just doing monitoring, we're counting abundance, but I've monitored painted bunting nests and actually watched those being taken out by fire ants. But it, it, most of the bird nests that I look at are in the trees. Are Dick Sissel uh, populations affected by that fire ants? Do you have any idea about that? As much as any other predator, you know, depends on how many there, what the density is. What are some of the specific things you're asking the private landowners to do for to increase the population of these birds? Well, in the in the grassland restoration incentive program that we have, we have basically a couple of practices: uh, prescribed grazing, prescribed burning, um, uh, planting of grasses and uh, native grasses, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, brush clearing. And so it depends on what what objectives they have for their land and, and how much money they're looking for. <coughs> prescribed grazing and prescribed burning is pretty cheap, seven to ten dollars an acre. Uh, the brush clearing is three hundred and fifty dollars an acre. So uh, we work with them on that and try to get them signed up into uh, USDA programs or get them signed up into our grid program if they don't qualify for USDA program. So wouldn't you get some brush though? Yes.
I'm gonna I'm gonna do what the speaker over here told us not to do it on the state of pain. So some species need brush, some species don't. When I say grassland birds that we're working with, we're working with shrubland species, the, the, the shrubland side all the way to the ones that use grass this tall that, that want that kind of lawn uh, or bare ground. So it depends on the species as to how much brush how much brush you need. So but if you have to fly to land that fly to land, you're not necessarily managing for any particular species. No, there's not some number. It's kind of what are their objectives? What do they want to see? What are they comfortable with? Uh, more native grass on the ground is better. We, we mix and forbs is better most of the time for the, for the, the insects are attracted to the forbs and the insects are food for the birds. And so that's kind of where I would put the point. So in terms of, of mowing, you, you, the mowing you don't know about the mowing except if it has no gene. <laughs> yeah, peak breeding season is maybe in July. Uh, the shreks that I was showing you, which are shrub nesters, they start in April. So some of the birds can start really early. And so you kind of want to cut off mowing, I would say, April 15th and not to start up again in July. And especially if you don't need to mow, if you're doing it for aesthetic reasons, uh, either mow often, and early often, and keep mowing through the season so you prevent them from nesting there, or don't mow during that breeding season. Yeah. So really what we, we just have to try to make a commercial company get the mow in uh, January, towards the end of the year, and then it ends in August. So really, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and then mow in strips, like was suggested with the bees, would help, because even in January, the winter birds need that, that cover. So if you're mowing for Say for the breeding season, yes. The, for the quality of hay, not necessarily. So it's a trade-off, and it's, it's what what are your goals? What do you need, and how wet was it? Are species like uh, the meadowlark and the big thistle long-lived enough that a sharp increase in population after a wet year will that carry over into the future at all, or are they all going to be dead next year anyway? That's what we're trying to figure out is, is how cyclic can they handle? I mean, it, it, it really bad years, how many really bad years can they take while waiting for that one good year or two good years in a row? They probably need a couple in a row to be able to, to wait out the bad years. And, and so uh, we don't know is the real answer, but, but That's okay. with a lot of populations, they're starting to be able to follow that. The declines of the uh, northern Bob White and the other grassland birds seem to be kind of tracking each other, not exactly, but I mean, they're steep. Um, as, so with, as with monarchs, too. Okay, uh, so does that rule out the impact of hunting on the Bob White quail being contributory, or? No, not necessarily. Well, I mean, not totally, but I mean, everybody wants to say that yeah. the sport, you know, industry is one of the reasons for the northern Bob where populations are low, if you're hunting out all the, the birds in that area, you can cause low boy excitation. So that would be bad. But where the populations are higher, and you know, are, well, I'm just saying quail that. are especially short-lived. So the mortality baby from hunting is probably uh, compensating the mortality that would have happened over the winter. And one of the things we see in Texas too is the bird itself That impactful to the northern Bob White uh, population if your other grassland species are declining as well. Right. If yeah. if if they're all declining, so it seems to me more connected to habitat than anthro impact, if you will. You know, especially when you factor in the conservation efforts of the hunters for the ability to be able to hunt. Yeah. Exactly. 
So that's what I'm trying to get to here. I'm not trying to say hunters are good or anything else. I'm just saying that it looks now disconnected at, now that I have more knowledge about the other rock and birds. Right. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. So hunters carry a lot of the conservation weight for grass <coughs> birds. I just want to say one more thing that I'm proud of. I'm a bison guy, okay? And we're uh, in the process of restocking over in the Paducah area, converting, you know, 45,000 acres to bison. And that family really manages for quail. And on the first year, which was last year during the nesting season, those quail instinctually went back to using the down for the bison that was shed during the spring and the next cycle. And we don't know if it wow. made a difference.